could take our seats, please. Dr. Jones. <laughs> Thank you. Say again? The microphone is not working. Um, I've got a contrary view from the back there. <laughs> Um, right, okay. Anyway, it's um, great pleasure to introduce um, an old colleague of mine. I've, uh, Steve and I have known each other for many years in our um, former NERC lives. Um, and I was delighted when Steve actually agreed to give this Newth Lecture. Uh, as many of you know, the Newth Lecture is one of our sort of prize um, activities during the year. It's a lecture that's been named after the, um, a, a former president of, of SAMS, a very notable physiologist, um, and he, uh, when he uh, died, we, it was decided that um, an annual lecture should be presented in his, in his honour, and that's the new lecture, and we are here, here today. I, am, I'm, I can't recall what number this is. Anybody know what number this one is? 20-something, 20, 20 anyway. So, And if you actually look at the website, go back to the website and have a look at the former um, lecturers. You are in very good company indeed, so it might, you might want to have a look at that. <laughs> okay, so Steve did his uh, uh, degree in Cardiff in maritime geography, actually. So he uh, um, comes from an interesting background. And rather than, rather than go off and do a postgraduate uh, work, he went straight into into industry, which is um, not a bad thing to do, <laughs> and uh, has been um, involved in many, many sorts of projects since. So he went straight into cable laying, surveying actually, so he worked on cable laying ships, and somehow or other, and I, I didn't quite follow how that gave you the qualification to become a customs officer, but anyway, he then, <laughs> he then, went, then went to become a customs and excise officer. Um, which is a, a fascinating bit, so I'll, I'm looking forward to hearing more about that over dinner tonight, actually. Um, and then, um, whilst he was doing that, um, he spotted an advert for a, an ex a scientific experimental uh, programme, which actually is, a, is really quite a famous programme. It's called WOS, which stands for the World Ocean Circulation Experiment. And I'm not sure exactly how many years WOS ran for. Is it ten? Like I think... Seven, seven, yeah. se seven, seven, yeah. seven years. Anyway, it was a very notable program, and yeah. and the data are still being used to this day. A very important set of data, um, where but basically the whole of the global ocean was surveyed using standard techniques, uh, very long transects crossing whole oceans and so on. And um, so uh, Steve was went to work um, as the UK coordinator of the, of that part of the program. It's an international program. Um, uh, during which time he was working at the very famous institute, um, IOS, um, at Wormley, to start with. And then, unlike most of us, who went, we went on senior NERC um, management courses, we used to move virtual institutes. So part of, part of the training that we had was, you know, how do you move an institute? and you have to go through all of the planning processes and so on and so forth, and it teaches you leadership and how not to kill each other in teams and things like that. But unlike, unlike um, the rest of us, Steve actually went on and did it for real and actually moved IOS to Southampton to create the Southampton Oceanography Centre, which then m merged, morphed into the National Oceanography Centre, which, which we know today. Um, once, the, once that merger had, had well, well, once the, the institute had been set up, uh, Steve started working on the auto sub project, and that's, these were some of the under, one of the, the earliest underwater vehicles, and indeed it was at that time that uh, Steve came and actually visited Sam's and worked with worked, worked, worked with Sam's people. He then went on to work in the science coordin coordination office that was hosted by NOC, and eventually um, went. Uh, in, that, in that role became UK delegate for the IOC, in, um, which was located in, in Paris. He then went on to become the uh, UK delegate for um, IOC. And about two years ago now, uh, Steve decided that having learned a lot about policy and so on, and he, he felt that he needed um, another change and successfully applied for the chief executive of the, the um, 
the um, Society for Underwater Technology. Yes, S S U T. Hold on. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Steve, it's a great pleasure to have you here, and uh, look forward to your lecture. Thank you. Excellent. Great. Thanks very much. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so, thanks, Nick, and thanks Anushka and everybody else who's been involved in inviting me along today. I, I hadn't realised how many years it is since I actually set foot in Sam's until I realised I haven't actually seen this building before. It's all been built since I was last here. Uh, so last time it was with Auto Sub, with Callanus, without her A-frame at the back because she'd have been top heavy out doing trials in the Firth of Lawn and discovering that at certain states of the tide you had a beautiful little lens of fresh water comes out over the Falls of Laura and your surfaced AUV isn't actually on the surface anymore because it's just underneath the, the lens. So, you know, hours of fun trying to find the blasted thing when it was actually on the surface. So, um, little picture up there for anyone that knows it. That's the Isles of Scilly, uh, St. Mary's, where we spent many happy hours when my children were smaller. And um, I think almost everything that we think about today in this talk comes back to really, it's about us, it's about how humans interact with the ocean. This isn't really a technology talk, it's, it's, it's a people thing. And the more I think about it, I always think that the, the issues that face humankind regarding the ocean are really people issues now, it's not the technology. Most of the big technological problems have been solved or are very, very close to being solved. Now it's up to us to use that technology right. So, um, what on earth made me interested in marine technology in the first place? Well, I, I suppose I'm very fortunate to have been born when I was. Uh, back in the 60s, you know, two TV stations, three if you were lucky. So you all saw the same programmes. When you went to school on Monday, you spoke to your mates. You'd all watched Lost in Space, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, Time Tunnel, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, you aspired to be Gordon Tracy, you know, and drive Thunderbird 4 and explore the... Explore the the depths of the ocean, and even the stuff that was in the movies, you know, good old Connery as Bond out there using state-of-the-art diving equipment circa 1967. And in, in fact, people that are interested in, in sort of the, the history of diving equipment will watch those old Bond films because it's the state-of-the-art stuff for the time. You know, if you want to see what was it like to dive before anybody had thought of inventing a buoyancy compensation uh, uh, device, <laughs> go watch go watch that and see how they're all zooming off to the surface every time anybody drops a weight belt or anything because they haven't got any chance of staying in place. So I'd love to have seen the decompression work they must have done after that, uh, after that film. And through as much accident as anything, the right place at the right time, I ended up not only being the UK rep at uh, Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, but actually the IOC vice chair. And you used to sit there thinking, how did the kid from the, the one parent family in the council house end up doing this one? But you can. And one of the things I think is very key, which has got nothing really to do with this lecture, but it doesn't matter. I'm lucky that I went through when you could go to university for free. You know, I owed 150 quid when I finished university. How many children can go through the system and say that now? And, and I think that's something we're not getting right as a society. So I'll stop the politics bit there, but it's, I think it does matter. Very, very briefly, who are SUT? Don't expect you to read any of that stuff, but we're an international marine learning society. We're 52 years old. Started off mostly uh, Navy divers based in Malta who discovered there were all these amazing wrecks and things lying in the waters around there, and they formed a society, and the rest, uh, as you would say, is, uh, is history. Uh, we have branches in uh, UK, Lagos, we're in the uh, United States, we're in Australia, uh, quite a few different places. I'm uh, opening my first Canadian branch next spring. Uh, we did think about doing it now, but we were told no, it will disappear under snow until about March or April. So uh, Atlantic Canada kicks off uh, second quarter 2019. We're just starting our first Middle Eastern branch and Egypt's on the uh, chart as well. Um, the strange photo in the middle, that's Rice University in Houston. Fella dressed as a owl making a pop video. He was called DJ Cheney. I was the only person he could find wearing a suit, so I ended up in his pop video. So, uh, so if you happen to be watching DJ Cheney's track called Birds, you'll see me at the very, very end. They said, ah, there's Br and he's British, even better. You know, they were able to find a British guy in a suit. 
So it's, it's great being a CEO of a private sector organisation. You end up in pop videos. It's, it's quite different. Um, SUT committees, we're interested in you know, the diving amount of submersibles, marine renewables, ocean resources, all kinds of stuff. So quite a broad society. Now, back to what I'm here for. What are the fundamentals of any human culture, any human society? You know, forget all the complicated stuff. It's pretty basic. You know, you need fresh water to be able to drink, you need food, you need shelter, you need heat, enough security not to get killed every day, uh, some sanitation, healthy potential mates so you can carry on with the species, some essential raw materials. And then you get the optional extras. You know, you want rule of law, you want peace, means of exchange, hope for the future. And for many, many human cultures, they've been able to obtain those things from living, you know, right next to the sea or at sea, or in the sea. Uh, and sometimes communities, even in the case here in Scotland, uh, there's a couple of pictures from the old days of the St Kilda community, who, uh, you know, less than 100 years ago were still there. Uh, and of course ended up being evacuated when some of those fundamentals were no longer possible on that island. Uh, and so it is a bit of a sliding scale, you know, as to just how much poverty are people willing to accept, uh, you know, how much hardship. Um, also, very early use of autonomous uh, vehicles. Um, you know, that's all it is. That's an autonomous surface vehicle, the St Kilda mailboat. You know, you know the, this isn't new technology when we come up with these new things, you know, drifters or floats, etc. It's just using new materials and new, new gadgets and technologies attached to old ideas. There we go. And, uh, of course, the problem with our very, very complicated sort of culture we live in today is that the, the more complex it gets and the more technologically advanced it gets, the, uh, the harder you fall. And, uh, you know, we kind of blissfully assume that we'll carry on with a civilised society, but there's no guarantee of that. We've had civilizations before which have, which have collapsed utterly, um, you know, whether by disease or warfare or natural disaster. And it would be naive, perhaps, for us to assume that ours will carry on forever. So those of us that work in this marine community, you know, in our own small way, and I say it's quite a major way, we do actually have quite an important role to play in how we're going to help steer humankind through a rather tricky next 50 to 100 years. Because this, we are, as a culture, at one of these tipping points at the moment. Things could quite easily go completely pear-shaped, or, if we do it well, we can survive for another few thousand years till the next uh, great potential tragedy uh, comes along. Now, some of you will have seen this uh, slide, especially those of you who've done any policy work. It's from the uh, Irish Sea Pilot study a few years ago by DEFRA and others. It's got the Island Man in the middle, and um, they start layering all the different human activities that happen in a relatively small parcel of ocean. And, you know, you could come up with a, a map like this for many parts of the world. And, you know, by the time you start adding in your, your cables, your pipes, your <laughs> places to test torpedoes, places to go fishing, places to extract oil and gas, and so on and so forth, you don't actually end up with an awful lot of marine space that isn't used by somebody. And this has been, you know, what has driven the development of the Marine Scotland Act and the Marine and Coastal Access Act in, uh, in England and Wales, so that we can start learning how we manage some of these resources, hopefully in a more joined up manner than we have in the past. Uh, we haven't got it quite right yet, but we've made a start, and we're, we're quite well a ahead of many other countries uh, in this. It's not perfect, but it's, it's getting there. I don't expect you to read that one at all. The letters are far too small. But uh, for my sins, one of my old roles was I was part of the Secretariat for something called the Government's Marine Science Coordination Committee. And we used to have to put together what were all the different statutory observations a, a government needs to have in order to manage its marine space. And so in there, I've got, you know, year-class strength of fish, invasive species, diseased hosts and pathogens, harmful algal blooms, salination of water supplies, uh, seasonal fair weather operations, uh, thermal stress of species, sedimentation, all kinds of stuff sat in there. And nearly all the parameters in one of those diamonds required some form of statutory observation or, or measurement 
basically to stop ministers going to jail. You know, these are things that the country has to do to satisfy international treaties and, regu and regulations. So if you weren't doing any other form of science, all of those observations were things that needed to be done. And to some extent or another, they are done. But they're expensive to do, uh, particularly if you're using a ship and you have a ship with a human crew on board. So there's a huge driver, particularly as we move into things like the Marine Strategy Framework Directive and its successors. How do you obtain all of those observations uh, at the lowest possible cost, you know, whilst satisfying legal criteria? So do you have the sensors? Do you have the ship time? Do you have the trained people to be able to do them? And so ocean-related jobs are now existing in a very, very wide variety for a very, very wide range of people. It's not just the scientists, uh, scientists and the engineers and the technologists. You also need people like the lawyers. There's a lot of lawyers working in marine science and technology now. You need insurers. You need finance specialists. You need administrators. There's a lot of military staff, the warriors I refer to there, and politicians too. So, you know, you can have a, a pretty decent career in the marine sector these days without having any actual marine background at all. You, you could be a good lawyer, you could be a good accountant who decides to specialise in that marine space. And there will be a lifetime of work for you in, in that field. And the human impacts are now so intense across the ocean as a whole that we really do need a much more global joined up approach to how we manage all of these different parameters. And it gets complicated when you're living in an era like now where some nation states are trying to assert you know, their sovereignty and their independence and trying to do things their own way rather than operating in a joined up manner. The sea doesn't really uh, recognise human borders very much. Fish don't care much whose territorial seas they're swimming through. And just in the case of the UK, you have quite a number of, of organisations, some government, some industry, plus the university side, that all have different, different pieces of the pie, you know, you know, in trying to look over and look after that marine space. So it's uh, important that you do get this joined up and have all of these different people speaking together. So there's quite a few emerging challenges. Here's just a few from the ocean sector. Um, first of all, the new industries that have been enabled by advancing technology and societal need. Now, some of the big ones that are just beginning to come up are going to be ocean mining over the next few years. We'll go into that in a little bit more detail shortly. The need to do carbon capture and storage, uh, that's going to turn out to be essential. Offshore energy production, uh, you know, the, the, the energy production that isn't just the oil and gas that we're doing today, but the new things that are beginning to emerge. We have issues about ageing infrastructure, you know, for the legacy sectors. When you start having 60, 70, 80 year old oil and gas platforms and pipelines, how often are they going to start to fail? You know, how, much, how often are you going to have to go out and repair them? Issues about invasive species, I've got the, uh, uh, the lionfish up there in the corner, which they're encouraging you to catch as many of as possible if you live down in the uh, Caribbean region now. So it's the one, the one fish you're allowed to fish to extinction, you know, they, they really want you to take those out. Uh, widespread take up of marine autonomous systems, we'll go into that in a lot more detail. And again, the friction between the assertive nation states who are operating outside of the agreed international frameworks versus those that believe in collaborative uh, uh, working. And looking at the marine space, by the time you start drawing 200 mile boundaries uh, around all manner of marine states, there's still a fair amount of blue space left that doesn't belong to anybody, but bear in mind that it's a Mercator projection, so it, it, it makes it look a lot bigger than it, than it really is. Um, but also that although the, the areas might not be, well they might be beyond national jurisdiction, but they're certainly not outside of uh, human exploitation, uh, you know, and it, you're really moving into the private sector, into my strange and weird world, when you start moving into those blue spaces, the places where companies, particularly if they're based in countries that haven't signed up to things like the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, can pretty much do what they like with almost no form of uh, holding back at all. And, and uh, this is going to become an increasingly important issue over the next few years. Now against all that stuff, uh, the UN, <laughs> I've put, the only reason I put if the UN survives, I, I googled something about the UN yesterday and I landed on a, on a US website. And my goodness, you know, it was all about when are we gonna shut them down? When are we gonna do this? When are we gonna do that? You know, think of all that real estate in New York that's been wasted, you know, with the UN building. And you thought, 
wow, you know, do these guys really think this? And as you, as you looked into it further, you thought, some of them really do. You know, you know, there are people out there who would like the United Nations to be shut down. So we can't assume that the UN will always be there as a force for good when you have powerful nation states who don't really like it very much. But you do have, by 2030, a whole bunch of UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, down here, number 14, uh, in shorthand we refer to it as oceans, although it actually just says life below water, which could be you know, quite restrictive really. But SDG 14, Sustainable Development Goal 14, is going to be quite a key one for us to work to over this next sort of 10-15 uh, year period. And it includes also the areas such as, uh, you know, clean water and sanitation, SDG 6 is there, clean energy, number 7, good jobs and economic growth in number 8, innovation infrastructure in, in number 9. There are a lot of ways where the whole ocean sector is going to come together working within this SDG system over the next few years. Uh, again, I don't expect you to read all that one, but some of those SDGs, are a little bit over-optimistic, possibly. I mean, look at this one, 14.2. By 2020, so, you know, less than a year and a half away, uh, sustainably manage and protect marine and coastal ecosystems to avoid significant adverse impacts. We're not going to have achieved that by 2020. Uh, there's another one here, look. By 2020, prohibit certain forms of fishing subsidies which contribute to overcapacity and overfishing. We're nowhere near shutting those down. We're still developing new forms of fishing subsidies. You still have countries subsidising the building of new motor fishing vessels at a time when we should be scrapping more of them, you know, if you really, really want to be controlling fishing effort. Um, you've got, uh, you know, the good ones, you know, increased scientific knowledge, etc., the capacity building. But up there, by 2025, of prevent and significantly reduce marine pollution of all kinds. Now, that includes like the plastics, etc. We're not going to achieve that in six or seven years. So some of these goals, they're brilliant goals, we should have them, but, you know, how realistic are they? Are, you know, can we actually achieve? And if we don't achieve, what are the sanctions? You know, no one's going to come knocking on the door saying we're going to fine your country billions of dollars because it hasn't complied. So, so you do have a problem with the SDGs. They're, they're wonderful aspirational goals, but where's the stick? You know, how do you actually make people enforce them? So back to some of the fundamentals. First of all, energy. Uh, the really cool thing is, of course, there's stacks and stacks and stacks of it around. Um, there is no shortage of energy in this world. Um, if you're looking at the legacy forms, the hydrocarbons, uh, every time we think we're running out, somebody makes a new discovery. Uh, the, we haven't even begun to exploit methane hydrates yet, you know, and there's probably sufficient gigatonnage of uh, methane hydrates to exceed all of the fossil fuels we've already burned to date. We can't do it because we'll fry the planet, but we're not going to run out of fossil fuels. As, as, as many point out, you know, the world didn't stop using steam engines because we ran out of steam. You know, the reason the world stops, you know, using old technologies is when better ones become available. And as we've already seen in uh, the, the generation of electricity, uh, solar, for example, is now beginning to undercut uh, most forms of uh, fossil fuel uh, electricity production, certainly in the countries that have a decent amount of solar energy. Even the UK, back in April, May, when we had some really, really great clear skies, we were generating 9.4, 9.5% 9 of the UK's electricity demand from photovoltaics, you know, from solar panels in Britain. Now, if Britain can do 9.4, 9.5% with hardly any of the country covered in solar panels, just think what people like, you know, Australia, the US, you know, China are going to be able to achieve in future. And the cost of solar is coming down very, very fast indeed. Um, so hydrocarbons, we still need them for now. But as we move away over this next 20, 30 year period, even without concerns about things like climate change, sea level rise, ocean acidification, simple market forces are going to change the whole economics. You know, what's the point of drilling a, a well in thousands of metres of uh, seawater and then penetrating down thousands of metres down into a reservoir, bringing up that oil, processing it, etc, etc, when all you need to do is put a bunch of solar panels on a desert somewhere. You know, in, in the end people will, that's what will kill the oil and gas industry. It won't be 
the environmental legislation. It would be good old-fashioned economics. And there are lots of new forms of uh, energy coming online as well. Um, the offshore wind side of it, uh, we're going to be moving into this third and fourth generation of platforms very, very quickly, where we're moving into floating platforms, so you're not limited by the, the shallow water depth that we currently plant our, our uh, wind platforms in. And this stuff ties in really nicely with the future concept of a hydrogen economy as well, because, because the, the problem with all of the renewables has been intermittent nature of the supply. But if instead of just producing electricity to cable to the shore, you're electrolyzing seawater, you're making hydrogen, you store that in tanks underneath the floating platform, and then you pipe the hydrogen ashore when you need it. You start using your renewables to produce storable energy, and then you combine that with hydrogen grid, hydrogen-powered vehicles, and you're setting yourself up quite nicely for a sustainable, long-term, low-carbon economy. And um, so for those of us that already work at sea, and in the case of my own organisation, most of our money <laughs> comes from the people generating uh, their revenue through oil and gas exploration at the moment, those companies are beginning to think of themselves as energy companies. You know, you speak to the senior people at Total, Chevron, uh, BP, they don't call themselves oil and gas companies anymore. They say we're an energy company. We currently produce our revenue through oil and gas extraction, but as we move through the 21st century, it's going to be other forms. And they're particularly interested, again, in things like, again, floating solar, and that could be either for direct generation of electricity or for electrolysis of seawater to make hydrogen. They're interested in floating wind. And a lot of the companies are interested, too, in how they'll combine floating wind with other streams of revenue generation, perhaps from combining them with uh, integrated multi-trophic aquaculture systems, you know, so it's hard to say, isn't it? Well, there's too many words in that word, but um, IMTA is probably easier. So, you know, you start being able to put your clusters of wind farms on the same installation as you're able to put your, you know, your strings of mussels, your macroalgae, your fish, your fish that eat the parasites that are on the fish, etc., etc., and put them into deep water further ashore. And then you can make more money than just selling gas or electricity. You can make money from the protein you're building as well. But there are a few wild cards coming up. I'll mention briefly Compact Fusion because it's such fun. Uh, if you Google Compact Fusion and Lockheed Martin, you end up with a very, very interesting website. It's the Lockheed Martin UK website. They haven't put it on the US version yet. But they claim that they can build a fusion plant. So it's not fission. This is the clean stuff, fusion. They think they can build a fusion reactor that would fit in an ISO 20-foot container by the middle part of the 2020s. Now, people always used to say fusion power is 50 years away. It's 50 years away. It's 50 years away. Lockheed Martin is saying 10 years away. And they've admitted they're doing it. They've told their shareholders they're doing it. And they've actually put it on the website. And I thought, well, gosh, big company, Lockheed Martin, is not going to mention they're working on compact fusion if they don't think this can work. If it does work, you start being able to power ships, aircraft, spacecraft. You know, you're talking Mars in less than six weeks. Uh, small to medium-sized towns in very, very compact nuclear systems uh, that produce almost no radioactive waste, uh, you know, run on deuterium out of seawater, and basically you, you've solved energy generation. Uh, and Lockheed Martin shares go yee-haw, you know, and they become the world's richest company. And um, it transforms the economics of everything. You know, if that can work, if that's a real technology and doesn't turn out to be like the cold fusion you know, of 20 odd years ago. If this works, that is a game changer. It's, it's one of the ones really worth watching because it just changes everything. So the hydrogen economy I mentioned briefly earlier, lots and lots of different ways of e generating hydrogen, whether it's from, a, you know, wind, solar, or, or, you know, or even just pulling it out of natural gas, stripping off the carbon atoms, putting them back into geological storage. There's lots of ways you can do hydrogen production. And then you start being able to feed into the existing gas grid with some modifications. You start putting it into transport, aviation, etc., etc. So hydrogen economy will happen simply because there's such a market need to make it happen. But if we're going to be moving into all these decarbonized, super-duper new systems, it does mean access to other kinds of material. And I drive a Toyota Prius. It's got 40 kilograms of rare earth metal in that car. 
Uh, I don't know how many million Prius Toyota have already made, uh, Toyota have already made, but that adds up to quite a lot of rare earth metals. Most of it's been mined in China, a little bit's been mined in Canada, uh, but the vast majority of the unexploited resource is down there on the seabed in a mixture of mid-ocean ridges and down on the metalliferous crusts in the deep ocean bed. So, if we want to solve global warming by not burning all these hydrocarbons, we want to start moving to electric vehicles, electric trucks, electric trains, electric aircraft, electric ships, etc., etc., you, you have a bit of a trade-off, you know. We, we stop frying the planet or acidifying the ocean with the carbon dioxide, but the flip side might be that we start having to extract a lot more metals from the deep sea floor instead. And there are huge gaps in our knowledge about what that is going to do. So, um, on this map you can't see a lot yet, but already the International Seabed Authority has licensed very large areas of the ocean floor for exploration. Just exploration, not production. Nobody's actually producing yet, but that's just a matter of time. Um, and lots of techniques, they're basically using similar techniques as, as are used in land mining, but in uh, remote operated vehicles down on the seabed that would be connected by various means to motherships up on the surface. Uh, UK is a major player in this. Uh, because the US never signed up to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, um, US companies aren't able to take part in the seabed mining yet, so they're opening their subsidiaries up in London and other countries instead, so that they're able to carry on doing the seabed mining, but through uh, comp uh, companies that are owned in other countries. Um, we're leaders in the manufacture of the mining equipment. Uh, I expect many of you have seen these photographs. There's a company called uh, Soil Machine Dynamics in Newcastle, who are in the lead of uh, um, the actual uh, machines that will be used to pull this stuff up. Um, these were built for a project that was going to take place off Papua New Guinea, a company called Nautilus. I'm not sure Nautilus are currently trading. They seem, they seem to sort of skitter around the edge of constant bankruptcy all the time. But this was for copper mining off uh, New Guinea. The Chinese were so impressed by the technology they bought Soil Machine Dynamics. And uh, although the company still exists in Newcastle, the replacement machinery has all now been built in uh, Qingdao and Shanghai. And so this first generation of mining machines will be connected to a ship. And I was at a conference a few weeks ago where uh, the Japanese, who were the first to actually demonstrate raising the slurry from the seabed to the mothership, uh, we're explaining some of the technical difficulties you have. You know, you imagine you're trying to bring up a slurry of pulverized uh, high metal content rock through a flexible pipe onto a ship. And, you know, you get any kinks or bends in the pipe and bad things happen to that pipe very, very quickly. So there's still quite a lot of technical issues, but they've gradually been resolved. And one of the areas of quite a lot of interest now is about having autonomous mining machines. You could leave the thing down there for a year or so, chewing up the seabed, and then just building nice little piles of material. And then when, you, you know, when the market prices are right, you know, the metal prices at the right level, then you'll send out the, you know, the grabs to bring the thing to the surface. You don't need to be constantly sucking the stuff up at the same time as you're mining. You can just go and chew it up, leave it in nice little piles, then bring it up when the price is right. So uh, lots of money to be made there by somebody. Um, in a small little way, my own society, I have to admit, we're slightly interested in the, the mining world because we're partners in the Bridges program, which is one of these EU 2020 things, uh, which is intended to develop uh, deep diving uh, gliders that would patrol the mining area looking for the fallout plumes, doing the environmental impact analysis, uh, trying to find out how much damage has been caused to the local ecosystem while it was being built. So the companies are, are aware that this is a problem. They're, they're not approaching this blindly. For example, I had a, a mining engineer said to me the other day, so if we, um, we chew up a, a cliff face in the mid-ocean ridge and we expose all this uh, virgin rock to the ocean, so it's going to oxidize, isn't it? I said, yeah, probably. <laughs> and he said, so it's going to take all the oxygen out of the, uh, the deep layer around it. I said, well, I don't know. And he said, well, we don't know either. <laughs> you know, somebody needs to do the research. So there, there, there is a lot of interest in, for example, if you're doing a mining activity, do you have to have an air pipe coming down from the surface just to make sure you're spraying 
you know, fresh oxygen into the uh, mining area to make sure that you don't accidentally asphyxiate every living thing down there when you start off doing your mining operation. So lots and lots of unknowns. So lots of work for us, uh, all of us. Fish farming. Now, I don't have many fish farms where I live in South Wales, but you have plenty of them up here. I passed a few on the train coming up this morning. And I'm very aware of the, you know, both the pros and the cons of the industry. And so are the producers. And this is a picture of one of the new installations that's been built uh, for deployment off the Norwegian coast, uh, built out in Qingdao, towed round. It's already in place. Uh, and the Chinese, the Norwegians, the Koreans, the Japanese, lots of countries now are building these much, much larger uh, offshore tank type installations in order to be able to position the, uh, the fish production further offshore than they currently do, hopefully so you don't get the problems of the sea lice infestations and the droppings on the shallow water, and to be able to massively increase the amount of protein that's being produced uh, you know, in the uh, offshore sector. Already we now catch, if catch is the right word, we will produce more protein is now coming ashore from aquaculture than comes ashore from wild caught uh, fish farming. And that trend can only increase over the coming years. But there's an interesting wild card in there, which is um, in vitro food production. And we've had a few people come and speak to us about this lately. There's a wonderful company called uh, Finless Foods out in uh, San Francisco, for example who are using stem cell production uh, techniques to basically just make your, your blocks of muscle fibre without having to bother making a whole fish. Uh, so you've probably already seen on the news the, you know, the, the $100,000 burger you know, and all this kind of stuff where people have just built you know, basically cow cells to produce a prototype burger. Um, I'm told they think they can get that down to a price that will match uh, a natural cow burger uh, within only four to five years from now. And uh, well, as, as production gets ramped up, obviously these things will become much, much cheaper. So maybe vegetarians will be able to start eating burgers again because the thing was never actually a living cow. Uh, so you can imagine for products such as, you know, fish fingers, you know, fish in, uh, fish in batter, uh, you know, crab sticks, you know, all of those kind of things, actually lends itself rather well to you know, this, this kind of vat-produced pr uh, protein method. But the interesting thing there is if this takes off, and again, I think it will, uh, imagine what this does to the, to the wild fish uh, product, because that then becomes a premium, high-priced product that people can pay a lot of money for, uh, because all the mass production stuff is what's coming out of a big quivering production line somewhere, you know, producing giant slabs of white fish meat. So, uh, some good one to get shares in. You know, anyone who's got a bit of spare money, you start investing in in vitro meat production, you're going to make a fortune. Uh, but as my wife keeps pointing out to me, why are we eating all this meat in the first place? You know, and if we're going to solve a lot of these problems, then maybe there's other ways around it as well. I should add she is not an elephant. So, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, Drugs from the deep. I had a very interesting chat with somebody the other day who said uh, who, who was very interested in all this bioprospecting side. You know, how are we going to go out and, you know, the blue economy, drugs from the deep, and this, that, and the other. He said, nonsense. I said, well, how do you mean? He said, we're not going to, not going to even do it that way. I said, well, how, how so? He said, well, just 3D print. You know, three, you know, he said, so we're going to use DNA printers. You don't need to catch a wild substance the middle of a mid-ocean ridge anymore, you know, and his whole argument was that uh, as human understanding of genomes, genomics, uh, bioactive compounds increases, that he said the, the real innovative work that's going to end up being done about a lot of these bioactive compounds is going to be production from scratch, you know, where, where your, your supercomputer designs the protein and then you print the thing. You don't even bother with a living entity in the first place. So he was saying that all these people investing millions in the assumption of blue economy bioprospecting might actually be wasting their money because there's a, the newer technology is going to bypass the whole thing completely. So it would be interesting to see if that happens. But if he's right, uh, it might be that we don't have to worry too much about some of these very sensitive ecosystems being ravaged by bioprospectors because it could well be that the, you know, the scientists are saying, right, what shape protein do we need to do job X? Let's build it from scratch, you know, and the machine does it right from the beginning. Um, Blue Jim, have to throw this one in. 
I'm one of these weird people that likes riding strange recumbent bicycles and trying not to get killed by heavy goods vehicles and such like. But I'm lucky I live in an area where you can do that. And there's been a lot of research done uh, across uh, not just Europe, but in uh, the States and other places. There are genuine health benefits to living in a place like this. You know, people feel better, they, li they live longer, healthier lives simply from living next to the sea. And um, I'm sure that all of you that live near the sea would agree with that. You know, who, who would deliberately go for a landlocked location when you have the choice of being able to live anywhere near a coastal spot? And so it means it's an attractive place to be, and we should aspire to have our populations, where possible, living in these marine areas and trying to live in some kind of harmony with it. Now, a little bit onto robots while we get into about the last 10 minutes now, I think. Um, robots are getting better and better and better all the time. Uh, the cost is falling, the data's getting better, they, they let your mothership go off and do other things while the robot gathers its own data. They can go to those places where humans prefer to avoid, you know, like under ice or in the middle of winter storms. And the reliability and the intelligence is getting better. The simplest of all, I suppose, it's still a robot, would be, be an Argo float. We're still just under that 4,000 float point. That was from uh, the second, what was that, uh, Sunday, wasn't it? So that's 3,953 of them at sea as of Sunday. So we'll be breaking the 4,000 barrier fairly soon. And these things are giving us a tremendous amount of data now about what's happening in that first 2,000 meters of the ocean. But of course, it's not only Argo floats out there. You know, we have autonomous surface vehicles. Uh, we have the gliders. We have uh, the new generation of machines being built by our friends across in China. And even some of the new prototype military systems, uh, like that one, uh, the, one of the, it's part of the Robo Tuna range uh, have been built for the US Navy. Uh, these things have been trialed going around harbors, taking photographs underneath aircraft carriers and warships and such like, and the sailors just wave at the fish as it goes past, not realizing it's a drone taking lots of underwater pictures. So, so these kind of technologies are advancing very, very rapidly. Uh, there's a character you might have seen on telly. Uh, he's um, I was him visiting the National Oceanography Centre a few weeks ago, just before he stood down as Foreign Secretary. And he was getting very, very excited by the, uh, you know, some of these new, very compact autonomous systems that are becoming available. These are the eco-subs being made by the Planet Ocean Group. And uh, do you guys own an Autonaut? Have you, have you got the, the Autonauts yet? This is the, the little one. Looks like a glorified kayak, but the... Um, they, they've been doing terrific work in showing how you can have these small autonomous boats that can go away to sea for you know, weeks or months at a time, helping to build up that knowledge, fill in the gaps as we go on. And of course, autonomous ships coming on very, very fast as well now. That was one of the Rolls-Royce uh, artist impressions they issued a few months ago. Um, the problem we got with autonomous ships, again, isn't the technology, it's those human factors. Uh, it, one of the main ones being uh, resistance to uh, criminal activities, uh, piracy, particularly jamming. Uh, very, very easy to jam uh, satellite navigation systems or the ship to think it's somewhere where it isn't. You have images of those old Cornish wreckers, you know, bringing ships ashore. And uh, these days you do it with a sat-nav jammer instead. You know, the container ship goes by full of uh, valuable goods and you think we'll just tell it it's three kilometres away from where it thinks it is and it happily sells itself into the rocks. You know, and how do we make sure that that kind of stuff is uh, uh, countermanded? You can tell I used to be a customs officer when the, when the thinking works that way. Um, you know, how do they respond to calls for help? You know, all of those things you expect a ship to be able to do. Who insures them? What kind of premiums do you get? What's the port of registry? Diplomatic clearance to go into somebody else's waters when there's no crew on board. So there's still, it's not the technology that's holding back the ships. It's those, those, those kind of human legal things and human criminality. And it strikes me very much, particularly when you talk to the people working again for the likes of Lockheed Martin and Boeing, how fast the technology is moving in things like artificial intelligence that you know, you know, most people just haven't got their heads around at all yet. Two aspects to throw in there. One of them is the, you know, the quantum computing and communication side, because that, that changes everything. I was in uh, Beijing a few weeks ago. And they were really excited talking about experiments they've been doing 
of trying to develop near real-time communication with submerged objects using quantum entanglement from satellites. It was just amazing. This is straight out of science fiction. And these were Chinese researchers saying they, they genuinely believed that within a few years they were going to be able to get real-time video uploads from submerged objects using quantum communications techniques. It's the one area of computing and electronics where they are way ahead of the West. Now, some of that could be propaganda, or it could be reality, but it does seem to be one area where China is making significant uh, strands. And for the Chinese perspective, this was all about essentially making the South China Sea transparent. They want to have a te uh, you know, the technology that they know exactly what is sitting in those waters, so they can counter whatever systems are placed in there. Um, flying back from Beijing, I watched this film. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Ready Player One. Steven Spielberg sci-fi movie. Absolutely brilliant. I think it's 2047 or 2048. And it's a, it's a society where people would much rather spend their lives with a headset on, living immersed in virtual reality, than actually doing real, like real life, which is kind of dull and boring and grubby and smelly and whatever. The virtual world was far, far better. It's worth watching if you get a chance because it, it, it kind of makes you think about some of these, you know, what kind of society we're going to be living in in 20 or 30 years' time. Maybe nobody will want to be a marine biologist or a marine scientist or anything like that because the virtual reality is more fun. So uh, who knows? Lab on a chip stuff, you, you'll be using techniques like that here. These things are getting better and better and better all the time. Uh, and we have their problems too. Oops, I get to the next one. But one of the most exciting things I've seen my own eyes in recent years is this environmental DNA techniques. And it, that stuff is absolutely amazing. The first time I encountered it, I visited the, uh, it was Rockefeller University in New York. And the researcher I was with, she, she took me down to the banks of the East River. She got a one litre water sample, took it out, popped it into the machine. We went off and had a coffee. 30 minutes later, she had a printout of uh, about 35, 40 species that lived in that sort of parcel of water. Couldn't tell you how many they were or how recently they'd passed through, but it was using those little scraps of DNA, you know, stuff that's coming off fish flakes, hair follicles, excrete, you know, excrement, etc., etc., and just giving you a nice little picture of what kind of beasts actually live in that water. And she was saying, hey, you know, in the future, you won't need a fisheries research ship anymore. You know, you just send out an autonomous, you know, drone or something with an eDNA sensor on board and it will be able to tell you what lived in that water without you having to catch physical samples. You probably need to catch physical samples to get the genome databases. But once you've got that database, the eDNA sensor starts doing all the work for you. And so um, these are some of the examples of one of the papers. I think this one is from Rockefeller. Uh, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, yeah, you know, of you know, being able to sort of look at the you know real world densities of species versus the the electro fishing and, and sending techniques. One of the consequences of all this is I suspect we'll see less of the work actually being done physically at sea. You know, it could well be that the marine marine research lab of the future is going to be people sat there rather like this one from Southampton where the the navy and the civilian are working together driving their fleet of underwater robots you know, from a, you know, an office ashore, or in the case that was one of the Rolls-Royce artist impressions, driving your container ship for, for, from a shore base because the, the actual machine is doing the work out there in the real life. Naval conflict, of course, nothing new. We've been using autonomous uh, vehicles for a long time. Drake used them back against the Spanish Armada in 1588. He just got fire ships, set them light, and let them drift into the opponent's fleet. That's, a, that's an autonomous surface vessel. Uh, being used for military purposes. World War I mines, World War II torpedoes. These are all early autonomous systems. They're just getting better and better and rather more brutal. Um, this one is the uh, Stator 6 or Canyon. One of the, uh, this is the one Putin boasted about a few months ago, which has frightened the life out of a bunch of people. It's a nuclear power torpedo with essentially unlimited range, uh, with a, a 90 megaton warhead, <laughs> cobalt salted are designed to take out places like New York Harbour or uh, San Francisco Harbour. You can launch the thing weeks, months or years before the conflict, <laughs> you know, and have it just cruising around the middle of an ocean somewhere very, very quietly, and then it just does a last minute dash into the target area 
you know, when, it, when it's required to do its job. Very, very difficult to detect, very, very difficult to counter. And they've already lost at least one. Uh, the Russian uh, Northern Fleet were uh, searching in uh, the waters off Svalbard not that long ago. Uh, we're not sure if they'd lost one of these or the air launch cruise missile equivalent, but they've certainly lost one of their nuclear-powered uh, remote vehicles already. So there are issues there for OSPAR and Bonn Agreement and all the rest of it about radioactive uh, contamination of the uh, northern waters. And the Russians have been releasing all manner of artist impressions of some of their new fully autonomous submarines. So not to be outdone, the US Navy have now released impressions of their new one, the XL UUV, <laughs> extra large underwater uh, unmanned vehicle. And this will itself deploy smaller <laughs> unmanned underwater vehicles, as well as torpedoes and Tomahawk missiles. This stuff's already funded, and this is very much the direction that naval warfare is going to be starting to develop over the next few years. So um, the French, in the mean, meantime, decided they still want to keep a crew on board their submarines. So they've already come up with this SMX-31 electric submarine concept, which is firing autonomous underwater vehicles and drones and heaven knows what. And the idea it stays away out of harm's, out of harm's way while it lets its robots go and do all the, all the work. So, you know, the Cold War is back with a vengeance and is unleashing all manner of spending in uh, research about these particular areas. Um, seasteading, just the last couple of slides now. As human population increases up to this nine and a half billion possibly more, you know, by the middle part of the century, if all these robot conflicts don't get us first, <laughs> you know, are people going to start looking at trying to build new places to live, new colonies offshore? Uh, China's shown how it can be done, you know, with what's been done in the South China Sea at the moment. We know the technologies exist. Will people start producing new, either completely floating autonomous uh, places or just uh, building new artificial islands to live upon? And the whole of geopolitics is changing quite, quite fast. You know, when you go over there and you learn about the, uh, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative and this idea about trying to expand into the world, you know, the, the East will expand over these uh, coming decades. You, we will have our Arctic ice-free shipping routes. You know, I don't think we can avoid that now, you know, which are going to take quite a few thousand kilometres off the trade routes across the north as well, and that's going to change a few things. And last couple... You know, will our new generations be less identified by the nation state, you know, by shared values and interests? You know, we assume that things carry on like they do, but they might not. You know, virtual communities, this goes back to that stuff in Ready Player One again. Uh, religion, you know, we assume it's dead because it's dead in the West, but it's not dead when you go to China, Africa, Russia, lots and lots of countries. Religious adherence is going up quite uh, greatly. And when I talk to school groups, I go to the, you talk to a Muslim school, those kids are absolutely on fire about science and technology. And they're going, you know, when we rebuild the caliphate, we're going to be number one, you know, science, technology, you know, we're going to run the world rationally, you know, you know, you know, science, and technology. Who knows, can they achieve it? But there's a whole generation out there who want to see the Ottoman Empire back and stuff like this. We're beginning to see the first stages of it in Turkey. You know, you could end up with a new global culture emerge over the next 50, 60 years which turns everything on its head. Not necessarily a bad thing, but it's going to be different. And of course, we've still got those frontiers to inspire. You know, we're not the only uh, place in the solar system with a decent amount of ocean. You know, you've got liquid water on uh, Europa and Enceladus under the ice. You've got liquid ethane oceans on Titan. All of these things need exploring. Titan's in a perfect spot by about 2047. So the kids that are going through university now are going to be in absolutely the right spot to be sending those explorers out to see what's in Titan's ocean. So, I'd say we're about to enter a period of profound change. Those old models, the balance of power is changing very, very fast. There is abundant clean energy resource available, you know, especially from the sea. You know, we're not going to run out of energy. There's plenty of energy around. And quality living space is going to be a premium. Perhaps we can use the sea for that as well. The true artificial intelligence changes everything. And it's not just the blue collar jobs. You know, if you've been following the stuff that IBM have been doing with Watson, it's making better medical diagnosis than the GPs. It was making better legal uh, uh, decisions than the lawyers. You know, it's making better financial decisions than the accountants. It's not necessarily the cleaners, 
you know, the janitors, etc., are going to lose their jobs to robots. It could well be the people at the top of the pay scale who are the more expensive ones for companies to maintain. And then will the human intelligence and AI converge? Will we find, you know, direct computer brain interfaces? So things are happening fast. We're heading very rapidly before, towards this truly transparent ocean. You know, using these quantum techniques, you know, using these new networks of sensors and things like the eDNA, you know, uh, you know, laser-based systems, artificial intelligence, the quantum communications and computing enabled us to process all those terabytes of data because these generate huge, huge quantities of data. But the computing is going to come on very rapidly to be able to do it. There is a global rules-based order we still need to be able to do all this stuff in a joined-up way. And uh, I suspect the future conflicts will be largely fought by machines and by cyber warfare rather than physical conflicts between people. So that's my last slide, which happens to be visiting my Beijing branch a few weeks ago. Uh, we had one random Nigerian who turned up. You know, we're not sure how he managed to be there, but everybody else was the... Uh, Thing. And again, these kids are totally fired up. They, they are ready to take their place as the future global superpower. Uh, I happened to be in Shanghai in November 2016 when Trump got elected. And they looked at their smartphones, their jaws dropped, and then they picked up and said, well, that's it, we're back to number one. <laughs> you know, order is restored. Uh, you know, China was the dominant civilization for thousands of years. It went through it, what they refer to as the century of humiliation, when they had this temporary blip where they, uh, they, they sharply went down. They're coming back to number one, and as far as they were concerned, what's happened in the States is the beginning of the end for that civilization, and they are the one waiting in the wings to supplant it. So, I've got a large and active branch now. <laughs> They're in Beijing and Qingdao. They're the future of my society. I suspect they might be the future of many societies. Uh, and we need to learn how to work with these people to jointly manage that, that global resource. So I'll stop there. I hope that's been of interest or given you some food for thought. And I don't think there's a lot of time left, but if there is any for questions, I, I, can, take a, I can take a few before we finish, hopefully. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Steve, that was great. Oh, is it on? No, it's not on. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Steve, that was that was excellent. I think, um, I mean, a whole, well, I mean, stuff I didn't hadn't got any idea that was happening at all, actually. So that's really fantastic. Taking that, the uh, quantum computing, actually, mm. sounds. That's, it's, it's I'd amazing. like to learn yeah. more about what that yeah. what that's all about. But yeah. anyway, <laughs> there yeah. we are. Anyway, any questions? I think we've got time for some. Just a little one, slightly given us. Uh, Do you want to me Merchant vessels. Mm. Uh, yes, uh, I, I I've sailed up the the Aegean quite a few times past the Dardanelles at night, because I like to sail at night. <laughs> and I've never seen one with anybody looking out the window yet. Yeah, They'd true. ignore you completely. And I thought, oh, these must be autonomous. Yeah, but yeah. they're not yet. No, not yet. It's, it's true, actually. In fact, when you look how many accidents are caused <coughs> by failures of the human yeah. element. When I was told, yeah. told locals about it, they said, oh, it's just the crew are all watching porn. Yeah, <laughs> well, it may well be. Well, there was the oh, there was a Greek, Greek ferry that went down a few years ago. And I think weren't the crew watching, uh, it was a football match. Uh -huh. or something and there was quite a lot of death in that particular accident where it had gone straight into the rocks because nobody was actually keeping the lookout at all I so mm. for everyone because if i hadn't i'd just have been right yeah. down yeah so no it could well be in fact the insurers uh we were speaking to this uh, lloyds recently and they said that the day will come when it's likely the autonomous systems will have a lower accident rate yeah. than the ones with humans on board and they said once that once that is proven almost overnight crews are going to come off ships because you won't be you won't be able to get a competitive insurance quote <laughs> mm. with a human crew as will happen with road vehicles you know you, know, you will probably find you, the tricky bit's going to be the the, the mixed yeah. period yes. you, know, you know when some of us are still driving and some people are using the robot cars you know the human drivers will be driving into everything and then eventually you'll get to the point where you won't be able to get cover for your self-driven car you'll only be able to get cover through the one that's got the autopilot so uh you know it, it will change faster than we think and goodness knows what they do about motorcyclists yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. any more uh, 
just to, uh, to see what you uh, make of this question. So I can remember a long time ago when I was young that I was told that most of this would happen by the year 2000. Mm. And some interesting things did happen, but nothing that was predicted. Mm. So what do you think the chances are of absolutely nothing that you told us about really happening? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, I, s some of them I think are pretty certain. I mean, the autonomy stuff is already, that, that's already on its way. And I'm, I'm pretty sure the deep sea mining is going to happen because people are voting with their with their wallets already. The, the shareholdings are already starting to move into that area. The wild cards are things like just how achievable is true artificial intelligence. Uh, I mean, we all, we've all watched 2001, you know, you know, and I think it was Hal's inauguration date was, uh, he was at the University of uh, Urbana-Champaign in 1997, and we still haven't built a computer that's anything like Hal, you know, you know 21 years after after that uh, and artificial intelligence it could be that the experts are wrong and it isn't actually possible <laughs> you know true autonomy uh, you know sentience you know that kind of stuff maybe maybe we don't get Arnold Schwarzenegger turning up and killing us all but the but we don't know you know it could well be if, if it emerges tomorrow within within weeks you've got Skynet or whatever the thing was called you know, you know it would be something that happens very very fast so there's a few uh, there's a few, and, and of course there's the things that we haven't even thought about. Uh, how many people actually predicted the internet? Uh, I think I first saw it probably about 95, you reckon, Stuart? It was the first time we saw the internet at, at NOC or the old Reynolds Centre. It was early 90s, you know, where people were showing, I think it was the NCSA Mosaic <coughs> browser or something like this, and everyone was going, wow, you know, what's this thing called the internet, you know? And, uh, you know, we just couldn't believe it. And, and here we are, now it drives everything. It's in barely any science fiction, uh, uh, you know, written before the, even in the 60s and 70s, it's, it's really not predicted. So I suspect that the, the things that will throw us are the things we haven't, we haven't thought about. Uh, and you only need one country to come up with something truly innovative uh, and it completely, it, it changes everything. You, know, you wait to see some of the results that come out of the Human Genome Project, and uh, you start, you know, start tinkering with uh, genomes. You know, there's going to be some very interesting, possibly negative <laughs> things come out of that. Biological weapons. Yes. Hi, how you doing? Um, yeah, I, I watched Terminator when I was too young. So I'm glad you brought up mm. Skynet. So a lot of this scares me. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, um, uh, you know, given the time scales you gave and the type of work. Uh, may be available with the development of AI and uh, autonomous autonomous systems. Um, I mean, I might just about be able to have work uh, through my, my career, but my children are four and ten months. Mm -hmm. I just wonder what you think they might be doing when, when they're my age. That's a good question. Now, I've got, I've got kids, and uh, my uh, my youngest decided, me having assumed as a parent working in science technology for years, she'll go off and do some nice you know, medicine, engineering, science, etc. She, she announced when she was uh, sort of 18, she wanted to go to university to do illustration. And I was kind of, what? <laughs> How on earth are you going to earn a living as, a, as an illustrator? And within weeks, she was having her first commissions and, you know, mer mer merrily drawing all this stuff. And now I've realised that actually the kids who go down that arty creative line may well end up be the ones that retain, <laughs> retain their jobs the longer, so I, I think human creativity is going to certainly be an area that you know we should we should encourage and and expand. Yeah, you know we're we're always going to need um, the people to mend the artificial intelligence <laughs> systems as well. Yeah, I mean those computers. We're a very long way off systems being able to self-replicate, you know, repair themselves, heal themselves from injury, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we've got a little while yet. I think before the robot overlords completely <laughs> take everything over. But um, I think what matters is skill sets more than the actual title of the degree, I think is going to be the key thing in future. And people understanding that education doesn't stop at 21 or 25. You know, you know people have to be constantly learning, constantly learning new things. And uh, if we do find ourselves in a world where it is, you know, human AI hybrids, at some point, you know, we're going to be enhancing ourselves. You know, I'm, I'm sure of that. You know, if you're if you're 
if you're working for a company and all the guys working for your competitor have all got brain implants, <laughs> so they've got you know direct access to the system, you're going to end up doing it too. So you know it could well be that within a century or so, you know humans would be rather different to how they are today. You know, speciation. You know, when does that occur? <laughs> yes. You say that human hmm? beings in a century or so. Do you seriously believe that the politicians are going to act? sufficiently quickly to halt global warming? No, I, I don't think politicians are moving anything like fast enough to solve the real issues, you know, you know that, that face the world. And, uh, so do you think then the human, this is going to happen? Because what you I think it will, but I, I don't know that nation states as we currently have them, etc., will continue to entirely survive. Humans, I think, will continue. You know, you know, there will be some form of humanity probably out for quite a long time in the future. But whether the structures are the ones we have today, still run by democracies, all this kind of stuff, uh, very, very hard to play. Imagine if we were sat here in 1918 trying to figure, you know, trying to plot how would the rest of the century play out. You know, it would be almost impossible to get it, to get it right. And I think there are so many uh, wild cards in the system now. Um, one of the things the Chinese were saying to me on, the, on that, back in that November 2016 meeting, they said, well, you guys just did Brexit, the Americans just voted in Trump, and you have the cheat to tell us there's something wrong with our political system <laughs> in China. And, and, and they were going, why do you assume that your system is better? You know, so, uh, who knows? Is it a new school? Got one? Or? Yeah. No. It's very different. If you gave, if I gave that talk in Lagos, they, they, whoa, you know, let me at it. You know, you know, the, they cannot wait for some of that stuff to come in. China the same. Um, you know, they're very, very keen. That yeah, the Nigerians are very up for it. The Chinese are very up for it. It tends to be the countries that are already in quite a comfortable place that feel most threatened by the changes that are likely to emerge because it's hard for us to see how this makes our situation any better than it is now. You know, in most instances, we probably, it goes downhill a bit. Whereas for the people who are still on the up, I think they look at these things as possibilities for a, for a, better, a better, brighter future. And quite honestly, some of them see it as a way of, of overtaking the West. You know, they see it as, you know, if we adopt these enhancements and things and you guys don't, we're going to steamroll past you, you know, is, is one of the responses that you, you get. Which is why I think that if, if, particularly if we're looking at, say, cybernetic enhancements, I think they will happen because the cultures that don't adopt them will very rapidly get left behind by those that, that do. You know, so, uh, you know, so for better or for worse, I suspect we're going to see quite radical, quite radical changes. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, I think perhaps on that sort of very thought-provoking note, <laughs> I think we should um, call it call it a day. Steve, that was really really splendid, and I think you can gather from the um, types and of questions here that, that I think you've really educated a lot of us, given us a lot of things to think about. And uh, maybe we should start opening a book now to see which ones of these things yeah. actually come, yeah, right. come true. But anyway, um, thank you all very much for coming. And uh, just like to ask you to thank Steve again in the uh, traditional way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.